Directed by Maria Jose Cuevas, The Lady of Silence, The Mata Vieta's Murders, the documentary film on the mysterious murders of Mexico City from 1998 to 2005 is finally released on Netflix. As the film releases on the streaming platform, we thought this would be the perfect time to give you an overview, talk about the ending and discuss some real life references of the film so that you can have the best viewing experience. A spoiler warning is in order as we will be discussing essential plot points and character details from the film but if you are done watching it already let's dive straight into the video. And yeah while you are at it please like the video and subscribe to our channel it helps us a lot. Thank you and let's move on to the basic plot. The series starts when Gloria and Dinarizo's daughter learns about her mother's sudden demise. She was shell-shocked at first but soon she understood that her mother fell victim to a predator who only kills older women. The idea that someone could harm the most defenseless group of people was beyond the comprehension of the Mexican police. The murder had set his sights on the adored abuelitas of the society. It took the authorities some time to accept that only one person was responsible. They could not ignore the fact that every victim was strangled in the same manner even though serial killing was not a common occurrence in Mexico. A report of a violent robbery that resulted in strangulation and had an elderly victim was discovered by criminologist Patricia Pan Vidana while researching cases dating back as far as 1996 to 1997. Finally, according to the Mexican government, a serial killer was discovered to be on the loose. The only thing that the victims had in common with the perpetrator was that they were all elderly women who lived alone. At the time, Mexico's public prosecutor Bernardo Batiz thought that the government was ready to handle the crisis, but that was not entirely true. With the families of the victims cleaning the crime scenes, it was even harder for them to solve a serial killer case because they lacked experience with it. The killer or the killers approached the victims dressed as nurses because the police knew from the witness's description the killer or the killers approached the victims dressed as nurses, additionally that the perpetrator was a broad strong person with short hair. The targets readily trusted them because they pretended to work for public policy programs. The seniors were grateful when someone offered to assist them in obtaining their financial aid card because the program was new and they were eager to learn more. A nurse who resembled the sketch of the Matavietas was detained by some beat cops after the sketch was published in newspapers. The witnesses came to the conclusion that she was not the person even though she truly had an uncanny resemblance. Matilda was ultimately released after nurses united in opposition to her arrest. The serial killer followed her victims and waited for them to be alone at their homes according to the police's analysis of her modus operandi. She could establish an instant connection with her victims and she consistently succeeded in gaining their trust. It used to be that she would strangle the victims with a component from their homes as the murder weapon. In order to keep track of the victims she murdered, the killer also frequently removed a memoir from the home. Although the method of operation was obvious, no one had been apprehended by the police. The police detained Araceli Vasquez after four senior citizens recognized her. She pretended to be a nurse and told the seniors she would give them financial aid cards, but she later robbed them. Araceli allegedly had the victim's watch and was the mastermind behind several break-ins. She was forced to speak to the press and given a white coat and wig to pose for pictures with. Despite the fact that the murders continued even after Araceli's arrest, the police concluded that she was connected to five different murder investigations. Immediately after it became clear that she was not the murderer, the search resumed. Jorge Mario Tabla Silva, who was accused of killing the seniors, was soon detained as another suspect. It was believed that he approached his victims looking like a nurse. He was identified as the serial killer by the police after they discovered a blonde wig, a nurse's uniform and a stethoscope in his home. However, in the end there was no hard evidence against him that the police could find. The police assumed they were copycat killers who continued to cause havoc in Mexico City when they could not find any supportive evidence. After intense pressure from the Mexican government to make an arrest, the police decided to summon transgender people to the station. Since the perpetrator was large and powerful, they assumed that they could not have been a female by birth. Workers in the transgender community were physically abused and subjected to tear gas while being forced into the advance. The sex workers' fingerprints were collected by the police. They randomly accused the sex workers of being serial killers. But he insisted he had not requested a lead and assumed local or even federal law enforcement had made the decision. While the sex workers claimed that they had been arrested by the police, Gail Mosias, the homicide prosecutor, denied this and added that they had been released shortly after the fingerprint check. Transgender people demonstrated against the abuse by the police that they had to endure it because of some conjecture without proof. 
The police deduced from the murder sites that the assailant used the subway to reach their targets because each location had a subway station. They also noticed that each location was close to a park which suggested that the perpetrator had made friends with her victims in the gardens or parks before leading them home and strangling them. However, the idea was quickly abandoned because the distance between some parks and the crime scenes was too great to be covered in feet. The next reasonable theory was that the crimes were cunningly committed close to a main road with a variety of escape routes. The killer sketches were given to the beat calls who were subsequently instructed to remain vigilant. The area that the killer frequented saw more police patrols. Having strangled Ana Maria de los Reyes, the murderer was unable to flee. She was still in the room when Ana Maria's tenant Joel Lopez arrived at her apartment. Joel Lopez was very close to Ana Maria and he made a habit of whistling to her. He felt a little uneasy when she didn't reply to it. He observed that the windows of her room were open and her belongings were strewn about the bed. He quickly discovered Anna's body on the floor and heard noises coming from the adjacent room. He investigated the commotion and discovered a red-clad woman. Before she calmly walked out of the room, they exchanged a brief glance. Thankfully, the police were out on patrol in Zaragoza Street when he chased after her and yelled for assistance. The woman in red was soon apprehended and taken into custody by the police. She assaulted a policeman, which led to her quick arrest and the Matavieta's case was finally resolved. Joana Barraza, a 40-year-old woman, was the serial killer. She had several voter identification cards, senior citizens' food stamps, and ton of business cards for the wrestling industry in addition to carrying shopping bags. The police were drawn to her keychain, which claimed that she was the world's best female wrestler and went by the moniker The Lady of Silence. Strangely enough, no one had ever seen her enter the ring despite the fact that she was well known in the female wrestling community. Most people didn't anticipate the murder to be a woman, they always thought they would be transgender. The police were even more taken aback by her cool demeanor. After questioning her, the police discovered that her mother had abused her and sold her to a man in exchange for a few beer bottles. Her mother was an alcoholic and a sexual assault by the man continued to occur frequently. She held her mother responsible for her unhappy childhood. Because she thought all women her mother's age were equally vicious, she wanted to punish them. She hated it when wealthy women refused to pay her fair price, so she killed them. They all, in her opinion, should have died. After initially denying that she was the murderer, Joana Barraza eventually admitted to killing Ana Maria and a few other victims. According to the neighbors who told the media that she chose to limit her interactions. She had painted her entire apartment red and it was stuffed with random things, probably those belonging to the victims. At the conclusion of the documentary, we see that Barraza's eyes were not filled with guilt as shown in the trial footage. It was intended to make a statement when Joana Barraza received a sentence of 759 years and 17 days in prison. Araceli Vasquez has been imprisoned for the past 19 years despite the fact that there was no evidence to support her accusation. Even though she had frequently claimed to be a thief rather than a murderer, her sentence was unaffected. The witness at her trial testified that she was not the murderer, but the police needed a suspect anyway. Araceli is still incarcerated for a crime she did not commit, despite the fact that the relevant authorities have forgotten about her. Mario Tablas was charged with nine murders, but there was also no hard evidence in his case. Later, Tablas was sentenced for a case in which Barraza's fingerprint was discovered. Though he always insisted he was innocent, he passed away in custody. By the film's conclusion, we also learn that Barraza, thanks to her good behavior, has found a way to make money while serving time by selling tacos every Tuesday. Later on, she also got married, but the marriage disintegrated quickly. According to some rumors, Barraza is the cause of the prison guard's fear and they always make an effort to meet her need. Barraza's story hasn't forgotten anyone after 20 years, making it worthwhile to keep going back to. The best part about the documentary is that it addresses the issue as the medium, popularizes the criminals and disturbed people, which unintentionally yet eventually makes them cult figures. The documentary also comments on the injustice in the system and how transgender people are constantly subjected to awful treatment by the authority. The suspense factor of the documentary is not uniformly distributed throughout its runtime, but the last confrontation generally got the best of me. I also like the stylistic choices of the filmmaker, which according to me enhanced the overall narrative and it helped spread the message the makers wanted to deliver more universally. Hey hey hey, thank you for watching this video. Do share your thoughts in the comment section about your experience of watching The Lady of Silence, The Mother We Ate The Murders on Netflix. Hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get your weekly dose of cinnamon series. See you on the next one and for the time being we are signing off. Adios, don't open the door to anyone and I'll be back.